How's it going YouTube? Come with you today with another video. And today, guys, it's the brand new is going to be the new episode of the podcast, episode four. I'm joined by some friends. If you want to go ahead and all introduce yourselves. Hi there, everybody. This is Rokalos here. Um, excited to be back again at another GGYGO podcast. Hey, y'all. This is Eva Lise. Uh, you can find me on Twitter and Twitch as that Eva Lise. Super excited to be back here, too. Hi, my name is Galzo. You can find me over on YouTube and also Twitter. Excited to get this going again. We have a lot of really fun topics to talk about today. We just got done with the Nationals and now we have Dune. So definitely a few things that we want to mention. If you haven't checked out my sponsors over on Imperium Duels to Dragon Shield, The Gem, or my brand new sponsor, Grimoire, definitely go ahead and check them out down in the description below. Thank you so much, Grimoire, for joining the team. I really appreciate you. And let's hop right in into our first topic. The first thing I want to talk about is going to be what is everyone's favorite card from Dune? I know mine is definitely just got to be Revolution Synchron. This card's a custom card. It's kind of insane. It's just a power crept glow up bulb. Card's actually just really nuts with a lot of the combos that I really like to do in the brand new build that I'll be talking about here in another slide. But if I want to do a more base card that's not Revolution Synchron, because we're already all talking about this card, it'd probably be Thelomatic Kratos. Uh, that card's really crazy. It's a rank eight that just says add a spell card if you can remove three spell counters. And there's definitely a few decks that can go ahead and give that spell counter. So very excited to see where that card goes in the format. So my favorite card for Dune is actually going to be Big Winged Burfament, <laughs> the unfortunate TCG translation. Um, this card is a retrain of one of my favorite cards of all time. Um, before there was Kit Kalos, uh, young Rourke had a, a certain thing for Burfamet and Gazelle, the King of Mythical Beast. And I am just loving that these cards are not only getting uh, a retrain's legacy support, they're also introducing a brand new type to Yu-Gi-Oh, the Illusionist type. And to me, Burfamet is just like the poster child of that archetype. He also has the coolest effect and he's a level five. And, you know, I have a thing for level fives. I would say my favorite from this set is I've been playing quite a bit with the Infernoble cards. So Infernoble, uh, the Infernoble Turpin, the level four is really cool because it can equip itself uh, from hand or graveyard um, to a warrior mount that you control. And it can also special summon itself if you have an equip card. And so it makes Infernoble OG like an instant rank four basically, which I really like about it. Um, in terms of like a, more like under the radar one, I would say Click and Echo. The the level two dolphins are really interesting because um, they force your opponent to have their whole hand revealed, um, which, you know, don't we all love hand knowledge? So I think it's a really cool card too. Especially Vanquish Soul players. They <laughs> like, Yo, wait a they minute. They like having their hand revealed so they can't summon anything. Oh my God, I was about like, to yeah. say that. It's like hitting them with the eye of truth. And Dark World. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Exactly. No dangers. Um, I think I'm going to represent fusions here as well. I think Magnum the Reliever, it's a super rare from the set. Um, really cool, like, standalone generic fusion. You can summon it off of Brandon in Red. It requires a monster special summon from the extra deck and one from the hand. So Brandon in Red works, Polly works, Cartesia works. And while Cartesia can't activate um, Guardian Chimera, it can activate this. And... What it does basically is that you can shuffle back a fusion or a poly from your graveyard, draw a card, or banish one of them and pop a card, which is really, really cool. Finally, your dead fusion deployments in the graveyard actually become pops, which is really, really awesome. And uh, yeah, sick. It's a fiend, light fiend. We love those. Yeah. So there's definitely a lot of new cards, but what is everyone's deck choice post Dune? For me, it's Monodome Tier. If you didn't get a chance to already look at my YouTube community tab or on Twitter, I did post a little replay that I think is really cool. I've been testing out the uh, new Chimera stuff, the new Illusionist stuff, and I'm really excited for it. The, um, the fusion spell, Chimera Fusion, is like not a once per turn fusion. It can add itself back to your hand. Um, it's a lot of cool, it's a lot of novelty with the new, uh, with a brand new type, the Illusionist type. And even though the cards are generally weak against interruption, at the very least, the engine is concise and has a strong ability to break boards, uh, especially with the likes of cards like Super Poly um, and the ability to run a, a plethora of non-engine. Um, and as I mentioned, I just I like the aesthetics and I like Burfamet. So, yeah. Yeah. So I mentioned some of the stuff with the Infernoble cards. Um, I really like those because, you know, we haven't really seen Infernoble in the meta since like kind of a lot of the toxicity around it um, kind of left the meta. So when Smoke Grenade was banned, you know, the deck was still around. And then you saw bans for like Link Cross, Hockey Fibrax, Aurora Dawn. 
And so like the deck basically lost a lot of its power from that. But now with these new cards, it basically makes the deck um, kind of do its own thing more. Instead of just ending on kind of these generic, you know, Appaloosa boards, um, you're actually seeing the new Link 1 monster that they have. Um, you're seeing like basically just getting locked into warriors and having to deal with that and seeing what players can do with those constraints. Um, I also really like the new Altergeist cards. Even though it makes the deck kind of like a fragile combo deck in some ways, um, the board it puts up can be so pretty formidable. So I'm interested to see what people can do with that because it's a lot of new tools, but kind of changes the identity of it. Yeah, I think that Altergeist was like my first deck. I have a really big soft spot in my heart for it. It's really, really cool to see that even after so many years, it's still getting support and love. I mean, it's been years and and it's still showing some signs of life, which is really good. I'm definitely going to build that. I have been testing the Chimera stuff as well within Branded, but I think there there might be a way to like make it into a standalone deck somehow. <laughs> I'm going to be really, really interested to see how that goes because with Branded, I mean, it it kind of works, but like Branded on its own is like a little bit better. But I think... For now, like my investments to like the future, I think the Synchron stuff overall, like getting all the love with like Assault, Revolution, Crimson Dragon, and it's just going to be sick no matter what. I really like the style of gameplay and I haven't really been, you know, playing a lot with Synchros and like combo decks so much. Um, so I'm picking up a few of these and I think those are going to be really fun. Also, Kit to One. Always. Get to one. Get to one. Just one. That's all we're asking for. We just want one. That's all. That's all I want. That's all I want. Just one. Just one. Please, Konami. So talking about the NAWCQ on the review, I'll go last on this one. But how was everyone's experience? Um. Yeah. I mean, NAWCQ is basically the the conclusion of the national season, and and it's probably the biggest one. Also, it's the it's like a really really great showing of all the talent in one of the the more um, probably the strongest countries uh, that Yu-Gi-Oh has to offer in terms of competitors. Um, my, my nationals compared to the NAWCQ was a, a glorified locals, but watching the NAWCQ, it was, first of all, it was just really impressive and really interesting to see all that talent go up on stage. Also, we had the playoffs the day before, which was super, super cool to have a look into a tournament that is completely different from the main event. Um, I think that overall, in terms of the viewing experience, there there were some fun surprises that I'm sure we're going to talk about, like heroes and stuff, some nice things on stream. But overall, um, I'm just personally kind of tired seeing the same decks over and over again. I think we're we're like at the end of the road with this format. Um, world is coming probably going to get a slaughter list afterwards and i'm mainly looking forward to like refreshing everything when it comes to to the meta so far because you know the visa slur is going to continue after this but maybe with like decks that are less toxic we'll see yeah i i share a lot of what you said about like the nawcq we saw like some decks that became kind of breakouts shout out to uh they know christmas with his hero deck that topped uh the nawcq um and uh, the Super Heavy Samurai Manadium Keshtira deck with the Fever Dream of a deck profile as well. Very interesting. Vice but... Starfrost. <laughs> True. Um, but yeah, I mean, some of this stuff is getting a little bit old. Like, you know, this previous ban list, um, we had hoped it would kind of deal with catch tier or more and even though it removed basically two of their end board options and a little bit of their consistency it's still a deck that you know kind of everyone in the room is worried about to some extent because yeah it turns out that having macrocosmos on a 3000 body that replaces its materials and also dryden's is pretty good um and so i think we're kind of getting a little a little tired of seeing that and i think that We'd like to see kind of a refreshing of things because with the with Duelist Nexus coming out, we're going to see, you know, Pearly get a buff. We're going to see Monadium get a buff. But those decks are still going to have rough matchups into Kashtira. So um, 
I think that still might be the best deck after this. So it, it kind of remains to be seen. So in an effort not to beat a dead horse, I share pretty much the same sentiments as Eva and Galzo with regards to the staleness of the format. I mean, the top four was all cash dira. But um, what I would like to um, bring up, which is uh, not something that I feel gets talked about very often with the NAWCQ is, uh, and Galzo hinted at it earlier, was the uh, playoffs that happened the day before. Um, I really liked, I really enjoyed watching that tournament because it offered, um, and, and if you watch like, um, or if you've listened to some of the pro players that participated in that tournament and listened to their deck choices, what it offers is a, a very narrow format. Um, you know, how would you approach like deck building and how would you approach, um, how would you approach like entering a tournament where you're not expecting a thousand people, where it's actually, you know, a small group of people. And this is a good window, a good foreshadow into what we could expect from the world's format, which is going to be a very narrow format where you can only, where you only expect 32 people who are the best of the best. Um, are they going to favor like hand traps, board breakers, um, such and such? So I was watching, um, because I, I'm an Exosister player, and I was watching uh, Steven Santoli's deck profile, and he spoke about his deck, deck choices that were different from the main event compared to the world playoffs, and the reason for why these choices were different. So in an effort to look forward into the upcoming uh, Worlds tournament, I think that looking at the uh, NAWCQ uh, Worlds playoffs, as well as the Euro Worlds playoffs, is um was refreshing um because the formats were a lot narrower and the just the 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 gameplay that is that was uh the gameplay that we observed was much more technical and really fun actually i i loved watching it yeah so nationals was just such a fantastic event to be honest it was a lot of fun it's always really good to be able to get out to these huge events just to be able to see everyone hang out have fun um, there was a lot of times though where I was like watching some of the gameplay, uh, especially even on stream. Unfortunately, you know, I tapped out after like round seven. It was uh, it was a rough one. Uh, round one saw no monsters. Uh, it is what it is. Uh, but when you start looking at the caliber of gameplay when you reach nationals, it's it's really inspiring to keep playing. To be honest, there's a lot mm -hmm. of things that will get passed through a lot of rounds. It just is because there's a lot of different things to think about when you're going to an event like that. Was I mad that I played Cash Tira over anything else, or would I have done better? No. It's like, Cash Tira still took top four, and I think that if you want the best chance in the room, and you're very familiar and do very well with the specific deck, then there should be no regrets going into an event like that. Especially looking back at my performance, I didn't misplay. I feel like everything that I did was super thought out, and everything that I did was super smart. Even my siding patterns, I liked my list a lot. I got a lot of confirmation when I saw some of the other deck lists come out because a lot of my choices were very similar. Uh, so that's one thing where I kept my head high when I left that event. And I knew that I did as well as I could have uh, for what I got, you know, dealt. I think that's really what Nationals is all about because it's just the year that's built up to that point. And even if you don't do as well as you want to do, I think that if you look at your overall performance versus your record, you take that with you and you move forward into the next season. Uh, and I know that there's a lot of people who are very amped up right now for next year because it's not going to be cash. It's not going to be the decks that we've seen. It's going to be a whole new thing. Uh, and we've already seen decks like Sword Soul like last year. And now we saw it a bit this year. So hopefully by next year, this should be a completely new idea, a completely new format. And even hearing about like the Synchron cards, that's actually really exciting because it's always been a deck that we've never really explored because it's something where it's like, well, yeah, you can play Synchron and you can like summon Junk Speeder, I guess, because like we had all these other decks that were like so much crazier. But now we have the support. And I think that's what's crazier. Even like Revolution Synchron coming into the game right now, that just seems super scary for like many different reasons. Uh, but I'm very excited for that. I think that card's going to be absolutely absurd. Um, again, it reads like a custom card, but I'm very excited to see what we do with it. So just a quick story uh, before we hop on into the rest of this. Uh, something that I did at Nats that not a lot of people know about that I thought was really cool. I mentioned this on stream. They said I should include it in the next video, so I want to. Um, I was in line for the voice actor signing. And I had gotten a couple cards signed. I want to do a giveaway uh, on my channel, which you guys saw, like the Book of Moon, the Regeki. And um, I found myself on Sunday with nothing to do. So I was looking around for Bakura cards because Ted Lewis is also Bakura and I love Bakura. I thought that was super cool. So I want to make sure that I got some Bakura cards signed. So I went up to the vendor and I was like, hey, do you have any Bakura cards? And he said, we don't. We have this legendary duels collection with Yugi and Bakura, though. 
So he's like, you can open this if you want. So I was like, all right, cool. I bought one. He was like, you know, my favorite card in the game is Dark Necrofear. And I was asking him, I was like, why is that? And he goes, I own 500 copies of it. You know, I pulled it when it first came out and I sold it. And I was so mad that I sold it. Now I buy every copy trying to get mine back. So I thought that was like super cool. I was like, you know what? I want to see what I can do. So I leave that vendor. I go to a different vendor and I find a change of heart. So I was like, all right, cool. I at least have one card for uh, the signing. I open up the legendary collection and lo and behold, I see a dark necrofear that pops out. And I was like, oh, I gotta, you know? So I went to the line. I had to wait for three hours in line for the voice actors to show up. And so I was like, it's fine. Like I made a couple friends in line. We hung out, it was a really cool time. And uh, I got it signed. And we went back up to the vendor and I was like, did you find any like necro fears, change of hearts, anything? I looked defeated like on purpose, obviously. And I was like, did you find any? He goes, no, but you can open like one of these again if you like really need to. And I was like, I'd rather just give you this one. And so I like, I gave him the necro fear. And uh, it was really cool because he was like stunned, obviously. He's like, oh my God, you know, like that's so cool. And it, so he rips open a uh, duels collection himself. Like he just grabs one and opens it. And then the first pack he opens was a dark necro fear. And he goes, I've never handed this to anyone before. I own 500. I keep them all, but here's this one's for you. And so now I own a dark necro fear and then I'll never get rid of that one. So sweet. I love that. <laughs> that was a very good story. Uh, very, very cool. Very, very cool. Shout outs to the vendor. Uh, it was it was a really cool time. Um, gotta love those stories from events, and you always gotta try to make friends and do cool things when you can. So very very cool. But on the flip side of things, talking about things that sometimes aren't as fun, uh, we have heard lately that Yu-Gi-Oh isn't super fun to watch. Do we agree or disagree? I know that when we see Eradicator and Shifter, and that's a one sided game. Not a whole lot of interaction to watch. It's just a blowout. It's not super fun. But I want to hear your opinions on that. Well, I think this is a very hard question to answer when you're a competitive player, because from my perspective, the game is fun to watch. You know, even even when I see an Eradicator for five, um, it's there's still some excitement to it, you know, because this is it's like the kind of thing that like it only happens in Yu-Gi-Oh! You know, when I see a, a Harpies for five, you know, shout outs to Jessica Robinson. Um, it's really cool. It's I don't know. But but I, I get it. I get it. Um, from a new player standpoint, if you're watching a game and you just see one person kind of do their thing for about like five minutes and then the other person tries to do their thing, but at, immediately at first activation, they are completely prevented from even playing the game. And then that's it. The game ends. You're kind of left there thinking like, wait a minute. What just happened? Um and it, moreover, uh, there's also a lot of uh, different effects going on in Yu-Gi-Oh! at the same time. And uh, televising all these effects and explaining them is going to be very difficult. Uh, that being said, I don't, you know, for me, this question always kind of comes back to like, um, is it meant to be entertaining to watch for somebody without any experience in the game? You know, like oftentimes I hear like, well, hand traps are weird because like, they just come out of nowhere. You know, it's not from the field. And so somebody who's new and watching the game isn't going to be able to understand that. Like, I understand that's a fair point, but are they really the audience? You know, like, are we really trying to, like, when, when we stream Yu-Gi-Oh!, are we really trying to, like, capture new players that way? Or is this, or is this content really for established players who understand some of these nuances in the game state? I'm not sure. You know, if they want to understand hand traps, I know a guy. <laughs> I think when I think when we see cards that are kind of like blowouts in the game, I think overall it contributes to this sort of state that isn't very fun or interactive for either us or for the people watching. Um, like when someone just uses a dimension shifter and you're like, past turn, like it's just not. It's not very interesting to see that, but, you know, on the flip side, when we talk about, you know, all these floodgates, like rivalry goes in, etc. Um, seeing players not able to summon monsters can be really frustrating, both as a viewer and as a player. Um, and I think if we want to bring in players, um, we have to kind of uh, make them excited about the game. Um, I remember when I first went to Locals, um, I was playing like a Luna Light 
I was playing like a Luna Light OTK deck. I knew nothing about the game. Like I only knew how to fusion summon. I didn't know how to summon the Tiger King that was in my extra deck. Um, and I was playing against somebody who was on uh, Ultimate Miss Drytron. And I was like, so this guy just, this guy just stops everything I do. And he was like, yeah, pretty much. And I was like, okay, how do I surrender? <laughs> And, you know, and, but, you know, like, luckily, I know, I guess I was glutton for punishment, so I kept going back to locals and such. But what if that wasn't, but what if that wasn't um, my experience? What if, like, I didn't enjoy the people that I met at locals, or I didn't know that the game could be better than that? So that was my experience, and I never went again. So, like, we have to, to the best of our ability, we have to weed out those things that are going to be kind of... um that are going to kind of push new players away. It really depends on what Konami's goal is at the end of the day. There is, um, when we're talking about the, sh the shareholders meeting that took place where we saw some feedback from it, you can check it on Twitter. I did a video about that as well, kind of summarizing what they talked about. But in general, the statement of Yu-Gi-Oh! isn't fun to watch, it can have a few different meanings for um, you know, different things. So in, in Konami's perspective, there is a fiscal perspective. It's a company that needs to make money and needs to have revenue uh, in order to continue growing. And I think that things like Dimension Shifter, EEV on stream doesn't necessarily push people away from the game. I think those things are relatively unhealthy and not extremely entertaining a lot of the times i know that like harpies for five is super exciting super epic anime moment you do love to see those things but again like eva said like you said rourke when a player cannot play the game on stream has to surrender it sucks it sucks for the players playing it sucks for the people watching it just overall sucks and i think that the ban of mystic mine was not a result of game design. It was actually a result of PR. I think that Konami understood that starting in Power of the Elements format, every feature match featured um, Mystic Mine. That was the face of the game at the time, and they just didn't want that to happen. Now there's a different problem, because there's a lot of things. It's not just Mystic Mine every game. It's many things that are rooted in a very deep game design problem that Yu-Gi-Oh! has not addressed in years. That's a long discussion about set rotation, things that just stay in the game and you can pick them up, um, you know, from the woodwork and start using them and abusing them. But overall, I think that, um, like Eva said, going to locals, that's already a huge deal for a person trying to get into the game, even just going, right? If the people are good, you're going to stay. You might get like, you know, killed in OTK, but you're just going to stay in locals and keep playing if the people around you are good. But in terms of the experience of watching the game, there's a lot to be done. Um, in terms of broadcast, Master Duel is completely missing. Um, I think the branding of the game currently is catered to children, while most of us who are playing are actually adults now. We do have that nostalgia for the anime, but People who have money are usually the grown-ups, and those are going to be the people who buy your products at the end of the day. Um, there has been a shift in, in the audience, and I think that if um, the fact that Konami isn't really doing anything to change that up until now means that they're probably fine with Master Duel and Duel Links bringing in the money, while the TCG is just like another way to fun funnel in money, because otherwise there's no reason why there's no communication horrible game design across every set in the in the past year and stuff like that. I mean, I could go on and on, but I think that Konami probably doesn't care enough about the TCG because it's not its main revenue stream. So we might not see any any of this actually change. I think that, that was grim, but I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think that like when it what it all boils down to when it, we talk about not being fun to watch, I think that from a competitive standpoint, like what Rourke said, I think is very valid. Where if you see someone get errated for five, everyone's like, "Oh my god!" You know, like it, it's crazy. Like everyone's like freaking out over it. It's super cool. Like at the time, 
but then you look at what just happened and you're like, I don't want this to be a problem. Because if you look at situations like they just limited Gamma and let D Shifter run, like that's not cool. And like we called that when it happened. Like literally everyone saw the ban list. The first thought was like, why is this gone? Because like Gamma was also fairly toxic. I won't lie. That card is also just like kind of <laughs> crazy. But at the same time, you can't let one evil run and the other one stay dead because at least that other evil killed the other evil. But like now there's nothing. So you can kind of just like drop things out of your hand when you want to. And it's just like kind of crazy. Uh, there's certain checks and balances in the game that need to be there for a reason. Uh, that's why I think like certain cards are allowed to be in the game. Even if people think that they are super broken like Zeus, I think that we're allowed to have good cards. I think that there's some cards in the game that are above that and those are cards that absolutely shut down mechanics i think that it's kind of crazy that we go from a format in tier where everyone's like oh my god my graveyard because of kelda mudora and now we're like where is my graveyard because of shifter you know <laughs> like it, it just sucks it sucks um and i know that there's this trope of you know content creators and players saying how much they hate the game but we still play the game but I think that there's got to be a break in that somewhere, right? Where, like, they at least hear what's going on. And I think that you also brought up a good point with mine when it got banned. That was definitely a PR thing, 100%, I would imagine. Because of the fact that, like, that was in every... Like, when you were waiting for a game, people were just, like, crumpling Mystic Minds on screen or, like, putting it up in the camera. Like, we were begging for that card to go for months. Like, it was, it was insane. Yeah. Like, it was... Yeah. Like people were people were seeing that from the tournaments, and like I had people who don't even play Yu-Gi-Oh who were like, who, like who just go on Twitter or something like that. Friends of mine who were like, "What is Mystic Mind? Like, what is this card about?" or something like that. Or Magic players who were messaging me asking me about it. Like, Th thank you for actually bringing up that example, Galzo, because it's something that I've been wanting to say for so long with regards to Mystic Mind, like. You know, opinions on Mystic Mind vary among the community. Some people think it should be legal. Some people think not. Some people like to bring up data of how many games it won. Fact of the matter is, none of that really matters. Whether or not you subjectively think Mystic Mind is good or bad, financially speaking, from a business standpoint, it just looks awful when you are typing up a blog or streaming a live event and your your you know your transcribers are literally typing player A draws and passes, player B draws and passes. Player A draws and passes. Player B draws and passes. And Konami was putting these on their website. It's awful. It just, it just, it's just boring. Yeah. Yeah. People have to understand that Yu-Gi-Oh is finite. Um, Magic: The Gathering, for example, is a game where, for example, the, the 30th year anniversary, um, Wizards of the Coast got a lot of shit for what they did with the reprints of, of cards that were not legal to play. And the Magic the Gathering people, you know, they can put their foot down and not buy product because of stuff like that. And Konami will eventually understand that if people are not gonna actually continue to play the game, even though right now, that, that's why I said Konami doesn't care because attendance is up, sales are good, Everything seems good from a numbers perspective. There's no reason for Konami to change their standpoint on the TCG. Think limiting Gamma and leaving Shifter is a slap in the face of every Yu-Gi-Oh player. It's just the most backwards thing to do. So, but people need to understand that if those things continue and we have nothing to look forward to in terms of gameplay, if we just see more bad stuff popping up every other set People are not going to keep playing the game and we're just going to end up like Magic the Gathering where competitive Magic the Gathering is a very small thing in the Magic the Gathering universe and everybody basically plays Edison, right? Imagine everybody just going to Edison and like YCSs are no longer such a big deal. Um, Yu-Gi-Oh! has an expiration date if Konami doesn't actually do anything, but Konami won't do anything as long as attendance is up you know, money goes in and everything is cool. Um, and it seems like they don't think anything is wrong. So, uh, I mean, otherwise, there's no reason not to communicate ban lists. There's no reason not to communicate anything to the community. I mean, that's, that's the way it seems like right now. I think where we see, like, attendance being up, sales being up and such, 
I think a lot of that can be attributed to actually the community rather than either the health of the game or the um, the non-toxicity of the meta or the accessibility of the, the price point for the game. I think it's due to um, kind of how the community has exploded in this sort of, um, you know, like since the start of the pandemic um, in terms of the online presence, in terms of YouTube, Twitch, Twitter, TikTok, um, a lot of these uh, kind of boom of social media has contributed more to it rather than the accessibility of the game on a variety of levels. Yeah, it's kind of crazy where we're at right now, just with the fact that, you know, things don't really seem to ever really be looking up. You know, I was talking with a couple of people and they were like, I want to be excited for these new cards. I really do. But can they play under D shifter? And the fact that that's a modern concern of just being like, listen, all these new cards are great, but this old card says that we can't play them anyway, so it doesn't matter. Like, that's the problem for me right now. Because there's a lot of people who are like, well, you don't like D-Shifter because you want Kit to 1 or whatever. You know, like, whatever excuse you want to come up with with why you think D-Shifter should stay legal, sure. But, like, it's one of those cards where if it was already an issue in tier format where you couldn't control having a graveyard... And now there is no graveyard. Anything, again, that shuts off a mechanic or a location, I don't like it. That's why IO is gone. That's why D-Shifter should be gone. That's why a lot of people want ERAD gone. A lot of people want Annie Spell gone. Like, Red Reboot's banned. There, anything that completely shuts something off just has no room in the game. I think, I think it was more understandable when, like, frankly, for before Kestira and before uh, Flo Andres, before Exosister, the best decks for playing Dimension Shifter were like Gren Maju and Unchained. And so, and like, you didn't, you weren't going into a tournament being like, God, how am I going to play around Gren Maju? How right. am I going to beat Unchained? Like, you weren't worrying about that. These were cards that they could use to some extent um, that they weren't really hurt by as much. And um, they were annoying to deal with, but, you know, they weren't really like top dogs. It wasn't like Tri Brigade could run D Shifter in those days. Um, but now when you see like a deck that would be one of the, if not the best deck in the room without dimension shifter being at the top of the pile, or when we are in tier format, the second best deck in the room being, uh, the deck that always was main decking shifter, that's when it becomes more annoying. It's this very accessible floodgate. The chimera cards have to be sent to the graveyard as fusion material. Gotta ban it. Gotta I missed, I, I missed the graveyard. I missed the graveyard. Yeah, it was fun to have one. Uh, you know, at some point we'll get it back. And we kind of talk about this in terms of power creep, right? And just how many cards we get that just say no to a location, no to a certain aspect of the game. Um, even looking at this card here, I know we're talking about this all a little bit. This is SP Little Knight. Uh, this card's absolutely wild. Uh, banishing a card in the field, and then if your opponent activates a card, you can go ahead and banish a monster you control and banish monster your opponent controls. I believe until the next end phase, I could be wrong on that. Uh, but it just, it's a double removal, which for no reason at all, a Link 2 is now a double removal that you can summon off of something like IP. And I think it's kind of funny because I believe when the Links came out, everyone was like, oh, they're bringing out Links to slow down the game. They gave us synchro monsters without tuners. Like, what do you think was going to happen? You know, then we got Firewall, and then we got Gumblar, and now we have SP. You know, so it's like, it, it's so crazy where we're always like, oh, this is going to be the next thing that, like, ruins the game, which we are due for a new mechanic, by the way. Like, it's any time now, it could happen. Any single thing that we get is just like, okay, how broken is it actually? And I, any single time that I hear somebody go, it's not that good. I'm like, give it a second, see what they print, because you never know what the next card's going to be that comes out. So I, I don't know. I think with Power Creep right now, it's kind of through the ceiling. But I think that to kind of prevent this from being like the overall issue, I think like when they were released tier, instead of absolutely slaughtering tier, I think they should have just printed more decks that worked like tier, like more decks that had the power level of tier. And just made a new level of format where like the power creep is there so like a lot of the older decks needs like new cards to keep up but like create a new format of just super strong decks that can just grind with each other the format kind of balances itself out if everything is super broken 
then you just go into more grind games and no one just getting the edge on anyone as long as these like super crazy blowout cards are gone then we get back to a lot more grind games and i think that's what people want to see now on the topic of power creep i just like to bring a little bit of positivity and say that i love power creep i love it oh my god i love power creep i love sp little knight i think it's fantastic we're getting cards like this I love it when new cards come out and they're just like so much better than the old cards. I know it's not like a popular opinion, but um, I, I enjoy it uh, for, the, for the reasons that you were just outlining. I love the, the power level of the format that we had when Ishizu Tier Limit was Tier 0. I don't want to go back to, and I, honestly, I don't want to go back to like slower and grindier games. Instead, what I want is I want power creep to get to the point where games are being decided in the first three turns. However, the amount of interaction that is occurring in these first three turns is through the roof. Um, and, 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 it, and it makes and it makes like the first turn of the game even like turn one be incredibly fun where both players are making plays. It's not just one person playing solitaire. I love that. And so I I welcome cards that allow us to play on both players turns i welcome cards that power creep older card design um i i enjoy it i'm a i'm a fan of, I'm, a, I'm a fan of power creep and keep it keep it coming konami i think in terms of power creep i can appreciate cards where they're just making disruptions better they're making your boards more sticky they're giving you more follow-up or something like that it's when the cards contribute like when it's going to take more for you to break a board or it's going to make it's going to take more for you to be able to have your follow-up or to establish um i think that's fun for the game so a card like little knight um i'm i'm fun with having that in the game um it's when you have cards that are going to like we talked about shut off certain mechanics that i think is when it becomes a bit of a problem um you know i've I always talk about like stronger trap cards coming out. Um, I love seeing stronger trap cards come out because they're usually kept in place by, you know, the mechanic of okay, you got to set them for a turn and then utilize them after. Um, but if it's a card, for the most part, for the most part. I mean, <laughs> Butler's here now. We have Ku Clock. You know. Yeah, 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 yeah. True, true. But um, but when it's a card like. When it's a card like Dimensional Barrier, like it doesn't really, like it doesn't really have that because it's you know whenever you flip it, it's just going to shut off a certain mechanic that you're going to be trying to go through. Um, so I think with Power Creep, um, as long as there is a high level of interaction that's still going to happen, that's not going to deaden you know five cards in your hand if your opponent flips Anti Spell then I don't have too much of a problem with it. Yeah, I agree. I mean, things, cards like Anti-Spell, goes in Rivalry, those have existed for years, right? Those have existed for a really long time. They do pop up here and there. But overall, when you have decks that shut off, I mean, I completely agree with what Eva said. When you have a deck um, whose main focus is to shut off a game mechanic, um, or go into your extra deck or banish things face down so you can interact with them. Um, even even shufflers. Uh, shufflers turn off most like graveyard interaction for a lot of decks. And just by having those cards, things like Drygtron, Branded, become completely unplayable. Um, if you build new strategies that rely on interaction, um, that's why tier and sprite format, I think, was really good for the most part because it mainly relied on interaction you just interacted with your opponent you had removal versus removal negates versus negates and this is what you play and those were this was a really really fun format in my opinion and looking back at it now um it was probably the last time Yu-Gi-Oh was like really really fun and not like super scary of like running into like draw phase. Am I okay to go to the standby phase? Okay, no eradicator, I can play. This is how it is like right now. You kind of have to give up. So I think Little Knight is great, looks great, great effect. You know, it is busted, but Link 2s often are. And I think it's fun to get that extremely busted Link 2 every once in a while. But 
it seems like, and we're looking into the future a little bit because we have um, Duelist Nexus releasing, I don't know when this is releasing, but in a week or so from now on. And we have Age of Overlord. And um, we also have like a deck building set in between. Nothing seems extremely bad at the moment. Um, nothing seems like it's breaking the game too much. And if you look at the OCG, things are looking okay. I mean, again, Pearly kind of relies on towers. You can really interact with it. Um, Labyrinth has its own problems, but overall, I think it's an okay deck. Um, and if we just get rid of the disgusting stuff and kind of go back to playing like old school Yu-Gi-Oh, but like faster and with more power, um, I think power creep is absolutely fine. As long as you don't go into, you cannot play territory. Yeah, I'd have to agree. I think it's really funny when you mentioned like kind of peeling over from draw to standby. It was like whenever I activate a hand trap and my opponent pauses for a second, I'm like, oh my god, is there a talent? Like, don't be a talent. <laughs> you know, it's uh, it's definitely interesting. There's a lot of cards you kind of got to fear when you play. Um, but I, I definitely agree. I really miss tier. You know, it's really funny in the OCG. Tier is like 14% of the, like the last tournament they just did and like top cut. Like, tier is cracked. Still so good. But they also have chaotic earlier. I mean, beside that, I think that the format overall right now definitely has a lot of issues. I really hope they get addressed. Uh, I think our next ban list is due in September, uh, but hopefully we see D Shifter at least gone. I think that would appease a lot of people right now. If we saw like D few Shifter, months from now, yeah, D Shifter months. or like Erad, maybe we see a cool little emergency list. Who knows? But like you know, we'll have to wait and see. This is the off season. I really wanted them to do a huge ban list for the off season and just like unlimit a lot of things and just see what works and what doesn't. Because there's a lot of cards in the ban list like Denglong that we're like that card can't come back. What has that card done at all? That card has done absolutely nothing. So it, it's kind of crazy. I think there's many cards that they could literally pull off the offseason and just be like, I wonder what it does. And then like right before the YCS, be like, all right, new ban list, just in case. It'd be kind of cool. I think I think Denglong is a very interesting case when we talk about power creep, because this is a card that, like, in a lot of ways, it's still kind of as powerful as the day it was banned. You know, it is a generic synchro five that searches you an omni negate counter trap and also gets you a secondary disruption after that. But you have to play three bricks for it, right? And a few years ago, playing three bricks for that, um, when games are a little bit slower and your board isn't as, um, you're not having as large of a board, um, that, that was a little bit more um, allowed for. That was a, that was a deck building concession that was, that was a you know, smaller pill to swallow. Um, but now in 2023, we've seen a few sword soul lists hopping with Denglong. Um, but on the whole, a lot of these sword soul lists are still playing their regular, um, you know, their very consistent packages, very few bricks and things along those lines. Um, just because while that power is still there, three bricks feels a lot heavier than it did in 2016. Yeah, I'd have to agree. It's always really tough whenever you're trying to go into uh, playing more bricks. Um, and I know that we were talking more so even about the, uh, the new player experience with that too. And I feel like you even get the same experience of like a new player feel whenever you're out of the game for a long time. So like, let's say that you see Denglong back before and you see how broken this card is. And all of a sudden you go into the format now and you're not seeing it do as well, but you're seeing a lot of the other decks just kind of go way crazier than Denglong did. And I think that's even more intimidating for a lot of people because at that point you're like, wow. Like, this game has definitely went too fast, and I don't really want to join back in. Um, and I think that's where, like, we start seeing a lot of the new players just say that they don't really want to play, or they get really discouraged in playing because they see a lot of these, like, really crazy combo decks just outshining cards that they knew. With regards to the new player experience, um, I have something that is... Um... I, I I don't have the the standard... I don't have, like, the, the, the opinion that most people have. Uh, like... I'm seeing a lot of discourse lately with regards to new player experience where Yu-Gi-Oh! is a very difficult game to learn and so it is it detracts new players because you can't teach a p person how to play Yu-Gi-Oh! in like an hour or in a day or whatever. That's probably true. Uh, I don't really play other TCGs, but Yu-Gi-Oh! If you told me Yu-Gi-Oh! was the most complicated one out of the big three, I would say, yeah, sure, that makes sense. Why not? Um, it probably is. 
Is this a problem, though? Um, that's kind of the question that I have myself asking, and I don't actually think it is. Because while Yu-Gi-Oh! has a lot of nuances that uh, might not be found in other games, and some of them get, get you know, start uh, becoming a little pedantic, um, like, for example, like the damage step, things like that. Um, the fact of the matter is that you can teach the basics of Yu-Gi-Oh! Uh, very quickly and very easily, you know? Um, the, 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 the simple basics of, like, what a spell card is, a trap card you set it first, and what a normal summon is and versus a special summon, that can be, that can be taught pretty quickly. And then you can start to uh, build up on these nuances uh, with, like, synchro summoning, fusion summoning, etc., uh, as you as you become more familiar with the game, and I think that's okay. That's a it's it's a it's a good trajectory. What I think that uh, where where I think that Yu-Gi-Oh really falters with regard to new player experience, it's more of new player retention. Um, and and I think that one of the reasons why new player retention is is like is 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 low um, or or might be low. It's one of the reasons. It's one of those things that like was mentioned in the stockholder meeting was uh, players who tried the game out on Master Duel first, because Master Duel is accessible. You just download it on your phone. And then they, they, they show up to locals, and this is from an OCG perspective. So they show up to locals in Japan, and they're like, this is completely different. Uh, I can't wrap my head around what's going on because you know I don't have the UI telling me and nothing is lighting up, and, it, and, and it's too much for me. I'm overwhelmed. I'm out. I don't want to do this. Um, that is certainly a, a, a concern to have. And I think that avenues like, uh, or platforms like Master Duel could do a better job at teaching these without holding the player's hand too much so that if they do uh, decide to then go on to a real life tournament, they can do better. But moreover, moreover, I just think that Yu-Gi-Oh! as a whole needs to do a much better job at reaching a wider audience. So, you know, if your game is complicated, there's not a lot of things you can really do. The game is complicated. Like it's it's gonna be that way. Like we're not we're not taking a time machine back to goat format. It is what it is. The game is fast. The power creep is here. It will continue to happen. Get used to it. But people will learn it if they want to. So instead, what Konami should focus is on is making sure that people want to learn the game. People want to learn these nuances. People want to learn what a synchro summon, what a link summon, what a pendulum summon is. And one of the ways we do that is by making Yu-Gi-Oh! more broad. Um, so I'm going to bring one example up and then I'll pass along the floor. But for me, for example, um, at, at Nationals, and I'll harken back to a previous topic, I, I cosplayed. Um, I showed up as Araya the Water Charmer. And that to me was a lot of fun. And there were a lot of other players who might not be, who may be more competitively minded than I am or less competitively minded than I am, where Yu-Gi-Oh! is more of a social aspect, who also cosplayed and they also had fun. But this, these things were given no recognition. These things are not, uh, they're not publicized. Um, why is it that we can't have a cosplay competition at a YCS? Why is it that I can't invite my friends over who don't play Yu-Gi-Oh and say, hey, I'm going to a YCS. It's like a convention. You all can cosplay. I'm going to cosplay. We're going to have a ton of fun. Maybe you try at a side event. They, they have this thing where they give you a deck and you can play it and you don't even need to buy the cards. And they might say, yeah, sure, I'll give it a shot. Why not? Because it's something that I enjoy. Um, or the, uh, the other example I like to give often is Dragon Duels. Um, why is it that uh, the Pokemon company advertises like uh, the junior division, the senior division, the master division? But for Yu-Gi-Oh, the only thing that we ever see streamed, the only thing that we ever see talked about is the main event. Um, we don't have like uh, publicized or live stream side events. Uh, like, for example, that huge Edison tournament that took place at Nationals, which had no coverage whatsoever. I don't know what happened aside from living through it vicariously from friends that played into it. Um, I don't know who won Dragon Duel. H how come I don't know that? Why is that not like, why is that not being advertised? If you want new players who are young and who will stay to the game, give them a platform where, you know, a little 12 year old who's playing the game and did really well now sees themselves next to the grown up that won the national tournament. It's cool. Let's let's bring Yu-Gi-Oh to more people, not just, you know, not 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 just try to focus on like, well, synchro summoning is hard. Yeah, it is. It's never going to be easy. You got to learn it. But if people want to learn it, they will learn it. I think that was a very thorough explanation of a lot of things. But, um, you know, and in my life as a teacher, um, I would love to 
like my kind of core passion is getting people to love something, getting people to love learning something. And whether that's reading, whether that's math, whether it's science or social studies or Yu-Gi-Oh, that's kind of the core joy that I get from just existing on this earth. And I think that like, while there is some like write-ups for like dragon duels or things like that, um, we could use more infrastructure. We could use more infrastructure for this um, because like I mentioned about how the community is, I think the community is why Yu-Gi-Oh is still expanding to some extent, um, not by like leaps and bounds, it's not exploding, but it has been expanding in terms of like um, numbers at competitive events and such. But eventually that may run out, um, whether that's due to the, um, a lack of popularity, a lack of boom from the community, um, but then it falls more on the foundations of Konami to be able to bring more newer players into the game because people, um, they move on with their lives. Some people get married and then they just forget about Yu-Gi-Oh entirely, which, you know, I can't imagine. But, you know, but that's what happens. They have kids, they get a new job, um, they move on. Um, and it should be, it should be very apparent that this can't continue forever necessarily. It can't keep existing on the goodwill of the community. Um, it needs to be something where it is having a self-replacing um, fan base and competitive aspect. So um, I think that there is a lot that can still bring people into Yu-Gi-Oh, but it can be difficult to explain, difficult to showcase, and difficult to get people excited about because it's not like you're watching a stream of Evo and you see, you know, like you see, um, you know, Chun Li kick um, Sagad or whatever, and all of a sudden, like you know, it says KO and everything lights up. It's not as simple as that. So I don't know yeah. wrestling intros. Let's we could get some wrestling intros, I suppose. <laughs> You're telling me that some people actually put down their cloth mat and hand shuffling forever. <laughs> forever. Insane. No, no mas. I I think Roar can even cover most of the, the things that I wanted to talk about, um, I kind of want to go in the opposite direction of there is th that thing about uh, what Rourke says about like the divisions in Pokemon. I think that, first of all, live streaming simultaneously different types of event at every big event can help new players make the connection between how Edison evolves into Master Duel and Master Duel evolves into like pro Yu-Gi-Oh, which is like modern format, and make those connections on stream and have a little bit more variety to see, okay, Yu-Gi-Oh is not just like one-sided, um, you know, extremely competitive Kostra versus Kostra matchups. It's also a little bit like the Yu-Gi-Oh I used to know, or maybe also like the computer game that I like that helps me with the prompts and stuff like that. I would go in the opposite direction of making Yu-Gi-Oh more competitive in terms of prizing and in terms of prestige i think that right now today it was funny because we were discussing what we talked about earlier i was discussing in my discord um, with some friends we were looking through konami's um revenue reports um for 2023 because we wanted to see if there's anything indicating a loss or an increase in in profit and revenue um because we wanted to figure some things out and there is actually an esports section in this year's world championship because there is going to be um, a championship for Duel Links and Master Duel. Mm. I think right now, Yu-Gi-Oh has that disparity of being a hobby that is expensive and really hard to get into. It, it becomes sort of like maybe even the attraction of getting into it because it is a little bit more complicated, maybe a little bit more expensive to some people, and maybe they find that actually fun. But when it comes to events, it is, like I said in the beginning, maybe the coverage is a little bit childish. Maybe the advertising is a little bit relying too much on nostalgia instead of, hey, what about if Rise of the Duelist comes out and we do a one-minute anime of the lore that's going to be in that set? How amazing would that be? Imagine. Or even 
making actual Yu-Gi-Oh, you know, there are no pro Yu-Gi-Oh players. No one is making a living playing Yu-Gi-Oh. So it is a hobby, but there's also like no attraction of of getting more people into the game. Um, what Call of Duty did, for example, a few years ago was creating the Call of Duty League that organizations can pay millions of dollars to enter the league and actually compete for you know prizes and prestige and a lot of money. And that brings in viewership, that brings in money, that brings in a lot of new players who want to follow the players they actually you know, admire in the game. So maybe that's a little bit of a, of a rough way to look at things because, you know, Eva talked about the love of teaching, which I, I agree with. I mean, it, it's, it's a totally valid concept as well. Um, but maybe there will be a day where Yu-Gi-Oh! has to be like, we're not getting new players. Players are getting older, they're getting married, they're having kids, they're, they don't have time for the game anymore and we're not getting enough people in. So they start doing like R-rated animes for Yu-Gi-Oh! to attract more people in. Maybe that happens in the future. It's hard for us to imagine that, but if Yu-Gi-Oh! doesn't make money and doesn't bring in the players, they might have to do that eventually. But we're not kids anymore. I mean, I wasn't extremely excited about like, like the voice actors were, were cool and stuff, but it just feels like every commercial is like, have you seen Magic the Gathering commercials? They do like insane cinematics for every new set. It like pulls you into the lore, pulls you into the game. Like, I want to buy that. Um, and they also do, like, collaborations with franchises now. Like, Lord of the Rings. I bought Lord of the Rings. I mean, I don't play Magic. I bought that set. So, maybe um, there comes a day in the future where they have to do, like, crazy stuff to bring people in. Yo, I mean, like, you know, like, this is something that, you know, TCGs like Vice Schwartz do, where, like, they have a... Miss Kobayashi's Dragon Maid set, or they have like a, a like a Konosuba set. I think was one of them too. You know, like having that sort of into the game. I'm not saying that Yu-Gi-Oh necessarily needs to do that, but it it would be interesting to see these sorts of different avenues. Well, I appreciate each and every one of you for joining me again on this episode. Tons of fun as always. I appreciate each and every one of you for being here. I just if anyone has not checked out any of their channels, all down in the description below, of course. Go ahead and check each and every one of them out. Any last words of the day? Um, no, just thank you so much, everybody, for watching. And I hope you enjoyed. Once again, it was an honor to be invited again to be on the podcast. Uh, check me out at uh, twitch.tv slash Rorcalos and YouTube and Twitter as well. Same thing. I'm Rorcalos everywhere. So thank you so much. Yeah, uh, I'll echo that. Thank you so much for, for having me back on here. I love getting to talk with all three of you. You are wonderful, and I love hearing your thoughts so much. Um, and um, like, I absolutely love this game, and I think it's very apparent that the four of us and many, 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 many others deeply love it as well. So even when there are harsh criticisms and such, it's because we've thought about this a lot. Um, maybe too much to some extent. <laughs> but thank you so much for having me out. Thanks for having me. It was a blast with the gang. I really enjoyed this forum. Um, second time. I love you guys. And also, um, buy Manadium. <laughs> Trust me. This game is such a great time and it's really fun. And I agree with Evo when we say that, you know, some of our takes might be a little harsh, but it's because we love the game and it's we want to see the game prosper. We want to see people join the game. And it's something where I'm always trying to get other people who haven't played or haven't played in a long time to try it out again. And I think it's a game that I'll be playing for a long time. There's just some issues we got to fix. Yeah. Before we sign off here, I just want to give my own apology. It's been 14 days since I posted last. Sometimes content gets caught up with work and other things in life. So sorry about that. We're going to be posting some new content soon. Over the weekend, I just worked 24 hours in two days. So getting back to doing a bit more content where the hand traps coming out very soon uh so i appreciate each and every one of you for hanging out 20k around the corner so excited for that too uh, if you haven't already checked out the instagram twitch twitter discord or my metify page definitely go ahead and do so all down below in the description and i hope everyone has a wonderful night i'll catch you all later thank you